Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Nick Partridge. I work at the National Air and Space Museum where I host a podcast called Airspace. And I am here today to bring you a very special April 1st program featuring who usually hosts these shows, the co-hosts of STEM and 30, Marty Kelsey and Beth Wilson. Hey, Nick. Hey, Marty. Hey, Nick. Hey, Beth. So we are here today and you are guests, not hosts. You two have been the brains and the bronze behind all of the National Air and Space Museum's great April Fool's pranks and videos. But man, it's 2021 and just who is in the mood anymore? Uh, but we thought this would be fun instead. So today we are going to play Two Truths and a Lie, National Air and Space Museum style, and Marty and Beth, instead of being our intrepid hosts, will be our terrified contestants. The audience can play along at home. You will hear three incredible stories about air and space history by three of our experts here at the museum one of whom is a lying knave. We have purposely kept Marty and Beth in the dark about this the entire time, and even who is telling the stories. They may recognize them, but they don't know yet. We will have a poll for the audience at home so you can vote on which story is the most incredible, and by that I mean uncredible, and feel free to leave your name and location, and if it's cool, we'll give you a shout out. Marty and Beth, how does that sound? Sounds good, Nick. This should be interesting. I'm looking really forward to this, but I got to say it's weird being on this side of things than the other side. <laughs> yeah, turnabout is fair play. So, border to border, coast to coast, and all the ships at sea, let's play the game. Please roll the first video. Hello, I'm Mike Hankins. I'm a curator here at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. I specialize in modern military aircraft, which is military aircraft post-World War II, essentially. And I've got a wild story about one fighter airplane during the Vietnam War pushing another airplane to safety. So in the middle of the Vietnam War, when things were at their most intense fighting, there was a mission of two F-4 pilots to go up north and bomb a target, and they both got heavily damaged by ground fire. One of them had its fuel tank hit and lost a lot of fuel. As they were flying back, they realized they don't have enough fuel to make it back to safe airspace. They're gonna have to bail out over enemy territory, which almost certainly means they're either going to die or be taken prisoner. So the other F-4 pilot said, hey, lower your tail hook. I can push you from your tail hook. And so as they're flying back, the one pilot has lined up his canopy with the bottom of the guy's tail hook, and they're literally pushing him as the canopy glass is cracking a little bit and they're trying to fly really careful make sure that the tail hook's lined up to the part of the plane that's not gonna crack the glass. They're flying, they, they can only really keep it lined up for about 30 seconds at a time before the pushing plane would slip off and they'd have to realign again. It's a very dangerous operation. It takes a lot of precision flying over the jungle at hundreds of miles an hour. They go about 80, 90 miles or so before they're able to get over friendly airspace and then eject. They land on the ground and they're later picked up by rescue helicopters and they all make it home safe. Marty and Beth, do you think my story is true or is it a lie? I, I now wish I was paying more attention in our gallery meetings that I have with Mike Hankins and maybe reading a couple of the books that he's recommended on the Vietnam War. Uh, I don't know. I, Marty, I know you have a story about someone who flew someone else's parachute down. Yeah, one of the most incredible stories at the museum that I've ever heard is one of the triple nickels. Um, para paratroopers during World War II who were African-Americans, not allowed to go over to Europe to fight. And so they did um, smoke jumping here in the United States. And during a training jump, one of them, Joe Murchison, jumped out of a plane. His chute didn't open and he landed on top of the other guy's parachute. And they're taught when that happens that you roll off and you engage your, your secondary chute. Well, he got tangled up. So he rode it down. Like, I know that stories like that happen. And I've read some stuff. And I think John Glenn had a, an airplane really shot up uh, during the Korean War that he made it back. So I lean towards thinking that this one is at least plausible. Yeah, I mean, because technically, uh, you know, one of the other great artifacts in the National Air and Space Museum is uh, the Ford Tri-Motor and it had three motors, 
you know, this was a plane built in the 20s and it had three motors for safety, but the wingspan was long enough, wide enough so that if all three motors conked out, technically it could glide to a landing. And I mean, it, that it, it does, and, and we've been on aircraft that have tail hooks and you know, those things are sturdy. So it's not like it's going to fall off. But are they sturdy going back up towards the plane or only pulling out? That's the piece that's got me messed up a little bit is, you know, we know that they're strong to, to stop that airplane from, you know, moving forward. But if you push that tail hook up, is that going to cause any, like, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know either, but I, I do, I, th I think it's a great story, first of all. Yes. <laughs> it's a terrific story. And I, I you know, and, and during Vietnam, that was a time if you landed in enemy territory, it was not good. So, you know, I, I'll have to see the other two stories, but, you know, I, I think that if I were in that situation, knowing that, you know, you, you an airplane can act as a glider, that's how the Wright brothers, you know, worked out how an airplane was going to work. Uh, I, I think it's plausible it's something I would absolutely try at the time. Yeah, I mean, how, you know, what what's the worst that's going to happen here? You know, I you know. Might start <laughs> You know, <laughs> I will say that my favorite part of the video that that was just played, and and Ryan and Devin are in the background. The cracks on the windshield that they added in the edit, that was impressive. So yeah, what's the worst case scenario? A tail hook goes through your windshield. Yeah, okay, That's, but you're you're already it's already a mess, right? It's I'm, already a mess. I know the story of the guy falling for forty five minutes through a storm cloud. I know stories of John Glenn saving multiple flights, including Ted Williams. Happy yep. MLB opening day. Um, but the cracks in this story for me are in that windshield. It's it's well illustrated so far. <laughs> most of our viewers from home uh, believe this one. Believe it or not cracks or no cracks. Uh, and we have people tuning in from Tennessee, Portland, Oregon, hometown in Virginia and Maryland, Florida, Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, Appalachian, New York, Queens, New York, Canada, and Dnipro, Ukraine. Thank okay. you for tuning in from the other side of the world. And everyone so far says, yeah, we believe that these pilots would have done anything for each other. However, one skeptic says, I know an F-86 could do this. I'm not sure about F-4s. So let's, but let's not also forget uh, uh, Chuck Yeager and his little fall. I mean, it's possible, right? You know? I don't know. I, I want my windshield made out of that glass. If you guys are buying this, then I'm buying that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, here's the thing. This is, this is only the first one. We have two more we have to, we have to, we uh, to uh, look through, so. That's fair. Shall we yeah. Shall we yeah. go to the next video? Sure. I'm Marty and Beth. I'm Kathleen Lewis. I'm curator of international space programs and space suits at the National Air and Space Museum. There's a little known story on how a Soviet film became part of the ritual the night before the cosmonauts launch from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Back in the heights of the Cold War, there was another race going on between the United States and the USSR, and it was a very unknown competition in cinema, in film. Whereas the United States had their spaghetti westerns, in the USSR and their allied countries, they had Easterns, known as Austerns from the German word from East. These films were not based in the American West, but were based in the Soviet East during the Civil War period of the Soviet Union and usually featured a lone soldier traveling, uh, longing for a return home. Uh, and these, these features were action, um, superhero films, and comedy as well, all combined. But it so happens it has a tie into the space race because Back in the 1970s, while waiting for a mission to complete, the Soviet cosmonauts and, and engineers didn't have enough time to return to Moscow after the launch. So they were stuck in Baikonur 
for a couple of days and had to sit around and with very little to do. And so they got a copy of the film, White Son of the Desert, which is uh, a Soviet made film from the early 1970s. And they watched it overnight. Now, as a consequence, the mission itself was a success. And what they did was adopt that film into their, their pre-flight rituals because that was a marker of success. Watching White Son of the Desert became the ritual part that even today, cosmonauts, astronauts, Japanese and European space travelers all watch the night before their launch as a marker, uh, a tribute to the good luck. Marty and Beth, is my story true or is it a lie? Okay, I want to start here with superstitions. It is mm. opening day here. Uh, you know, so uh, unfortunately the Nationals have postponed the game tonight. But I learned during the World Series just how many superstitions like baseball players have. So don't you think that's a great tie into sports, Marty, for a change? Oh, it's, it's awesome. I'm wearing my, my American League championship <laughs> ring today from when I was a camera guy with the Royals. And, and I can tell you from not only the players, because I was a baseball player for a long time, but all the way into the, the front office and the guys and the girls that are running the, the video scoreboards in the stadiums, huge superstitions. You know, if you had a hot dog before the game, and they won, you're going to have a hot dog before the next game. If you wore this pair of pants, you're going to wear that pair of pants again. I mean, it's it's huge. And I know that the superstitions with space travel are there even in the American space program. You know, we've talked to several astronauts that have, have talked about those traditions and, and they, you know, their superstitions, traditions kind of back and forth. And they're yeah. a big, big part of it. Um, but this it, one seems really plausible. The, it, it does seem plausible. And I will say that, like, I love the way, you know, superstitions become traditions, you know. And and I, I know, you know, in the space program, there's always a, a big breakfast before they go off. And I could never understand that because I think sitting on top of a ballistic missile for a ride in with I wouldn't want a great big breakfast. I, you know, I know that there are some very crude superstitions and traditions that you all can look up on your own. Uh, but I, there, this would not surprise me given, you know, sort of that, those things that they, you know, they have incorporated into this. I mean, they all sign the, the door, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of that going on. So I I would not. I this may be true, you know, but we still have one more video too. Yeah, so. our, our our friend Mark Vandehei, who we've worked with before, is getting ready to go off on a Russian Soyuz rocket here in the next month or so. And I'm kicking myself for not asking him about the tradition so that we would know the answer to this. The <laughs> one thing at, at one point in Kathy's video, she glanced down at her notes and having and I thought maybe that was a tell. But then having worked with Kathy before, she takes really detailed notes on index cards all the time. And so whether this is true or not, that's that's part of, of Kathy's presentation style. So in I'm not a superstitious guy. I'm a <laughs> little stitious, though. But it seems to me between you, me, and the back rear tire of the bus, that if they had all of these superstitions, they just never get to space. Who would have the time? They're watching movies now. It's like a fistful of rubles before you have to you have to take off. the uh, The audience is split on this one. Um, says that even if this is true, it sounds fake, and that uh, it sounds false to have this many rituals before a, a launch. South Africa, Maine, Edmonton, and Missouri weighing in this time. Do remember to uh, chime in, leave us a note, and tell us where you're from so we can shout you out. Um, yeah, I don't know. Is uh, is Kathy cribbing or fibbing? Well, here's the, here's, here's the thing, though. Keep in mind that, you know, there are they lock themselves away for two weeks before they leave. You know, it's, it's, it's sort of like the pandemic right now. If you're running a fever, 
you're locking yourself up for two weeks. You know, it's so they they are in quarantine for two weeks. So what else are they going to do? And having know. done a lot of research for STEM and 30 and gone through the, the um, NASA Flickr sets, when you see the astronauts, the American astronauts that launch from Russia, there are some weird pictures there. I mean, they have pictures of, of like the American astronauts. Some of them are cool because they're in their full like military uniforms or if they're not military suit and tie and, and you know, very formal pictures. And then I can vividly remember a picture of Paolo Nespoli, who's an Italian astronaut in like this giant headdress, you know, sitting cross-legged in a tent somewhere. And it's all part of that tradition that goes with it. So I, I don't know about this one. Yeah. I don't know. I'm going to draw the line when somebody tells me to uh, eat planters peanuts while chewing Beeman's gum. <laughs> I'm not sure that any amount of mission luck is uh, is worth it at that point. I'm skeptical. Yep. But we, yep. yep. It's a it's a good story though. It regardless. is. It is. It's a it's a it's a tale as tall as a rocket. <laughs> but we've got one more video to go, so maybe let's see. Um, shall we play the third? Let's do it. Hey Marty, hey Beth, I'm Emily. I'm a researcher in the Center for Earth and Planetary Studies here at the museum. And today I'm gonna to be talking about moons. So when we think of a moon, we think of our moon, which is something that goes around our planet Earth. We also know that there's a lot of things that aren't planets that also have moons, including moons. There are moons with moons, but these are a special kind of moon called Trojan moons. So a Trojan object is something that's called co-orbital. It essentially means that it orbits in the same orbit as something else. And Jupiter's Trojan asteroids is the best known example of this. The Trojan asteroids of Jupiter are a cluster of asteroids that follow along Jupiter in its orbit around the sun. So if Trojan asteroids are asteroids that are gonna follow along in Jupiter's orbits, a Trojan moon is a moon that's gonna follow another moon in its orbit, which is a little bit different from the kind of regular moon you sort of think about when you think about a moon that goes around a planet. So Beth and Marty, do moons of moons truly exist? Or is this a lie? I'm, I'm all messed up now because these no, are I'm just three people very confused. <laughs> that I completely trust. You know, we've worked with all three of them and my mind is a little bit blown now because that one like space is weird. Like there's just weird stuff going on all over. And, and we've learned about exoplanets and all of these different things. So moon of a moon seems really plausible, but I also haven't heard that term before of, of a Trojan moon and co-orbital. Although the definition across the bottom, like there was a definition there, which makes me think legit. Yeah. The, the thing is, you know, it's Emily. You know, and she's so smart and you want to believe everything that cut and so sincere. I, I don't know. I mean, is it more likely that a tail hook pushed a plane across airspace or that moons have moons? And what's with Ash? I don't, I didn't get the whole thing on asteroids. I'm really confused now. Um, I'm wondering if that's strategic. Is this a tissue of lies that we're being led into with physics and math because they know that we don't have the uh, whiteboard to check it out ourselves? Yeah, I know. And and Emily is one of those people you can sit with at lunch and you'd be like, oh yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I understand. Oh. Yeah, I'm not getting this at all. <laughs> what's, what's amazing is, you know, before, before the pandemic and, and before construction started at the National Air and Space Museum, we had a great cafeteria. And we would sit in the cafeteria and it was not unusual to have a planetary scientist, the world's leading expert on some airplane and a four-star Marine general sitting at the same table with educators from around the museum. And they'd start telling stories. And, you know, we, I know we had the conversation of, do you punch a bear in the face or a shark if you're getting attacked? Like that was a legit conversation that we've had. So these kind of conversations come up all the time. And I've never heard any of these stories. Uh, so viewers should uh, vote in the poll. Our poll is now live. We've seen all three videos um, and we are looking forward to seeing what they think. Early comments, man, people are just not buying this uh, this moon of a moon thing. And maybe it's because Trojan moon, like somebody's got to be telegraphing that, right? Like 
Trojan, really? Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. based on falsehood. Uh, also, Marty, I've got a note from Kathy. It's called a yurt. Oh. <laughs> the tent is called a yurt. <laughs> that's awesome. Thought I'd pass that along. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I, I just, uh, all of these, you know, What's great about all of these is that there's there's some point in there where you can be like, yeah, I can see that. You know, I can totally. And and I know that Emily's an expert on moons. Like she she knows about this stuff. And it, I see outer moons of the I I see moons of the outer solar system. I've and, said that phrase a million times because Emily is also my co-host on the podcast. And I can absolutely picture like the scientific paper about, you know, seven Trojan moons discovered around, you know, this far distant moon. So I'm just so, trying, I'm just trying to picture like what a moon would look like going around our moon. Moonception. <laughs> right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I... It sounds like lunacy to me. And while we chew on that and give our audience a little bit of time to fill out the poll, which is now live, reminder, um, why don't we re revisit some of your greatest hits? Um, why, don't we, uh, why don't we take a look at one of the museum's previous April 1st videos? I give you Wonder Woman's Invisible Airplane. Hi, I'm Marty Kelsey, one of the hosts of STEM in 30, based here at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. I've got Beth Wilson with me, who, Beth, you've been working really hard to bring this plane into, into the museum this week. Yes, we have. Um, we worked very hard with the uh, Museum of Flight in Seattle. Uh, they actually take care of the plane that we have here, which is Wonder Woman's Invisible Plane, and they were very generous in loaning it to us. Now, as you can see, we have it in the jet formation. Uh, typically, they display it in the plane formation, and that was one of the tricks of getting it here, was to get the plane to shape shift, because we really wanted to show it in the jet formation. Museum of Flight was a little worried about it, but our conservation staff worked with them, and as you can see, the plane looks great. It's a lot bigger than I thought it would be. Yeah, um, Bob Vanderlinden, who is a curator in aeronautics, worked really hard to, to get this space. So as you can see, we've had to remove both the Spirit of St. Louis and Spaceship One to make room for Wonder Woman's invisible plane. Now, how long is it gonna be on display? Only one day. It's gonna be here April 1st, and then it's got to uh, come back down and we'll take it out to the Hazy Center. We'll, we'll do a little more work on it before we send it back to the Museum of Flight. So there you have it. Wonder Woman's invisible jet on display for one day only, Wednesday, April 1st at the National Air and Space Museum. When you guys pitched me that, I have to admit, I didn't see it, but I was wrong. <laughs> one, of, one of my favorite things about that particular day um, was that one of our curators went down to give a talk on the floor and he had a laser pointer and there were people gathered around to listen to him and I had to give him some talking points. And he had a laser pointer and he would point the laser pointer at the ceiling and everyone would turn to look up at nothing because it's an invisible plane, but everybody's looking for it. We put signs out on the floor and, and then we kind of wandered the floor that day, you just watching people's reactions. And I saw this one kid and a mom and the kid's looking at it, and he looks up, and the mom's looking at it, and she's like, is it the orange one? And he's like, Mom, it's invisible. I even pranked one of the security guards that morning, walked into the museum, and I was like, hey, did you see the new plane they hung up? And he's like, new plane? Show me. And we walked over there. I was like, right there. He's like, like it's Wonder Woman's invisible jet. And every guard around came unglued, and he looked for like a minute and a half and then figured out that we were, were messing with him. Um, what yeah, was, that one was fun. Famous yeah, well, Yankers of Chains, you two. <laughs> what, what was fun also was working with Museum of Flight because they had uh, done a blog post two years prior and they just put chucks on the floor 
and and signage and then we have you know colleagues there and i said hey you know we're redoing the the gallery and we have these planes down can we loop you into this joke and they were like sure that's great and when i went to revisit their blog they now have on the blog uh the jet is currently on loan to the national air and space museum at washington dc so, <laughs> so it can yeah. And we got a request to borrow it from us uh, this past year, but we uh, yeah. we weren't able to we weren't able to make it work. And this actually showed up as a question on Jeopardy. Um, and Beth, you've got a fun story about that, don't you? Yeah, it's really it's really cute. Uh, this question showed up on a Jeopardy episode a few years ago, and uh, I happened to be watching because someone I babysat for was actually guest. Uh, player on Jeopardy and uh, pitched to that to that question, and, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, that's so cool!" So I had sort of a two a two fur for that one. And if you want to have fun with some folks, you can send them that video. But also go check out the Tribble Breeding Program on YouTube that we did a couple. Of, I think this was the following year. Um, we had some some Tribbles in the, in our collection, and we uh, you know made sure that that population is still strong. And and there are. Um, yeah, lots of tribbles around. Yeah. Nick, you wrote the blog for that, didn't you? I did. I did. I wrote the blog and the press release for the Tribble Breeding Program. And I got to say, some of my proudest puns. And man, Air and Space Museum, there is no shortage of puns. But yeah, the Tribble Breeding Program was something special. Uh, now, people warned us what would happen. Our curator, Margaret Weidekamp, told us that it was a bad idea. And <laughs> Now half of the museum is under reconstruction and the building is closed. Coincidence? <laughs> Maybe, perhaps not. <laughs> so our poll is just about ready. Uh, we've got viewers from all around the world, including Romania and Argentina. Thank you for tuning in and let's go to the poll results. Wow. Very close, but- yeah. Yeah, yeah, tail hook pushed by a nose right now, an impenetrable glass nose. <laughs> I don't know. I'm. Uh, I lean towards the the um, the movie tradition being true, and I lean to and so I'm I'm torn between the other two. I, I, Trojan just to me feels like that's to throw us off potentially. Yeah, I'm going with my gut. That's all I've got to go with. And and I and I just think that that the moons, I just and it's only because I've never heard that term before. And I've been at the museum for 17 years. I could be wrong, you know. Uh but you know. I I think I'm going with the tail hook push. I, I don't think I don't think you can do that. I don't think that works. Okay, so I, I, Marty, I Marty, I know you were taking notes. Is that what you wrote down? It, yes, I've I've been taking notes the whole time, and and um, I I I think that one's made up. I don't I don't think that one can happen. Okay, I, I'm going to go with the moons just because I I've I've never heard that terminology before. Okay, um, so and, and the it's the whole parachute story that sold me on the. You know, I've I've heard the I've heard the wild parachute story that I would have never believed had I not heard it come out of somebody's mouth that was very trustworthy. Now, I'm not saying that Mike Hankins is distrustworthy, but um, well, let's uh, let's give let's give Marty enough rope uh, to do with what he will. Let's uh, let's play the reveal for video one. The first time I heard about this story, I was a little bit shocked and a little bit skeptical, but it was absolutely true. Captain Bob Pardo was the F-4 pilot that did the pushing. He had his backseater with him, First Lieutenant Steve Wayne, and they were pushing the damaged F-4 Captain Earl Amon with his backseater, First Lieutenant Robert Houghton. This really happened and they pushed him back over into Laotian airspace uh, to get safety. Uh, it's something that's been really celebrated in Air Force history. Pardo's push is what this is known as. It's just wild. It still blows my mind. I mean, both of the pilots involved ended up getting the Silver Star, which is one of the higher awards you can get in the military. And I think they definitely deserved it. 
as a historian, it's incredibly important to be able to do research and be able to fact check things and know that things are true and have different ways of verifying them. So in the case of Pardo's push, most of the people involved uh, lived for a long time after this, and they've talked about it multiple times. They've given interviews. They've written about it. And then we can also weigh those against some of the actual uh, artifacts evidence. If we have physical evidence that we can look at an aircraft and say, did this happen? Uh, if we have maintenance records, if we have other types of hard records from the time, we can compare all these sources and say, what is most likely to be true? What do we think really happened here? Uh, it's sometimes impossible to say with 100% certainty that this definitely happened exactly this way, but we can usually, by combining all these different types of sources, get a very good idea of what's going on with any particular event. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that because I'm working with Mike on the modern military uh, aviation exhibit, and I don't know that I could have gone to my meeting next week. If <laughs> <laughs> and I love how he talked about the primary sources and the, and the research that went into a story like that. Um, and then after hearing him talk about it, it's like, how have I never heard this story before? I, I've never heard any of these stories before. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I will say that hearing the, you know, the triple nickels talk about, you know, essentially riding a parachute down, I, I just thought, well, it's not out of the realm of possibility. Nope. Uh, get me a windshield made out of whatever that was, I guess. <laughs> um, okay, so we're down to two choices. What do you guys think? I, I'm going to go with the moons. Sticking with the moons. That's yeah. where I'm leaning to, but I also feel like now, now I'm really messed up because Kathy seems like, honestly, of the three stories, like Kathy seems kind of the blandest in the middle. Like, oh well, yeah, that that happened, of course that, and now that's making me really wonder. So I'm gonna say the movie one. Yeah. Would anyone would anyone make up White Son of the Desert? Yeah. All right. Well, um, well, yeah. let's see what let's see what Beth's uh, Beth's uh, sleuthing has yielded. Uh, let's check a look at the reveal for video two. This story is true. When I first heard about it, I was stunned because, first of all, I'd never heard of an eastern as opposed to a western. But as I, I looked deeper and uncovered the story, the fact that these were derived from the German word for East, Ost, and they were known as Austin, um, and watched the film myself, it was uh, in many ways a very typical Soviet film. It combined action and a superhero role and a bit of comic um, and a little bit of sexism and, and, and racism to boot. Uh, but this film has become a, a ritual and it's become known uh, throughout um, among cosmonauts and astronauts because they all know that not only are they supposed to watch it, but they're supposed to have the lines from the film memorized. They're supposed to know when to say that the East is a very complicated thing, um, with the, which is for cosmonauts and astronauts a very um, ironic use of the word because, of course, the word East is Vostok, and it's always referring back to the Vostok spacecraft from the 1960s. Um, they were also supposed to understand the joke that is the section where um, the soldiers are asked if they have any questions and immediately told that there are no questions, which is mimics the role that the astronauts and cosmonauts have to play on their mission that they're not supposed to have any questions and object. So it, it's really kind of funny, um, but it's also a taste of, of 1970s Soviet cultural life, which is a wonderful thing to have and be preserved over the decades and almost, well, finding out whether the story was true was immediately simple, but complex. Um, it, there's an old saying in the Soviet studies field it's that you can't document what an old babushka told me, um, which is the most common source of information. Uh, you have to go back to the source. Um, a friend of mine who grew up in the USSR initially told me about the film, but I had to find out through other means that this actually happened. Uh, and I went around and asked, asked cosmonauts, asked them if they knew about the film. 
if they did indeed watch it. And then after a while, it started popping up in other places. So it began filtering out in all sorts of ways um, from that initial offhand comment that a colleague had told me about many years ago. And then finally, it became revealed when I visited Baikonur to see a launch several years ago. And it was part of the ritual, including the people who were coming to Baikonur as tourists to see the launch. And they too would watch the film as they were preparing to see the, the Soyuz launch vehicle take off from the Cosmodrome. Hi, Marty and Beth. Thanks for having me. So two things. One, I'm really bad at this game. But but two, what I took out of what Kathy said is that White Sun of the Desert is effectively the Christmas vacation of the you know the Russian space program where they played on the lines. It's, it's yeah. it, no, it's the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I, I mean, I bet you they have like props too. So that'll be my next question for Kathy. You know, when they yell toast in that, does everyone yell, throw toast at the yeah, so screen. So, uh, so yeah, this, right. this, this did seem plausible to me because of all the rituals that that they have going into these launches. Turns out Kathy would not lie to you. And is anyone surprised that we're down to one video and that Beth called it? No, not yeah. all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know. And so, it, it, but it's hard to believe that Emily would just make something up, right? Yeah, this sounds totally possible. Right. I, and Emily Emily can sell it, it too. It was the Trojan port, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was, yeah. I've never heard that term and after working for so long at the museum that that would have come up at some point in time and I would have remembered that. But you now, know? wait a second. You say that you would have heard that term. You've never heard about the airplane pushing the other one on the tail hook and you're on the modern military gallery. Yeah, I'm gonna have to have a talk with Mike about that. <laughs> yeah, no, Beth's got great instincts, uh, and Trojan Moons sounds like something that's entirely made up. However, what kind of museum would put subject matter experts into a live broadcast to tell lies? So the lie today is me. The lie is a lie, and I have been lying. Let's play the uh, let's play the horrid truth about Trojan Moons, shall we? So this is true. There are moons of moons or Trojan moons. I'd heard of Trojans, right? Trojan asteroids, especially Jupiter's Trojan asteroids, but I'd never heard of a Trojan moon. I didn't know that Trojan was sort of just this word that means follow along in the same orbit. The idea of a Trojan moon or Trojan asteroids or a Trojan in general is not just a theory. It's something that's been observed. They've been observed by both spacecraft and also ground-based observations. So one of the cool things about science is that it's kind of always changing. Our idea of a moon was really shaped based on the fact that the Earth had a moon and we always could see Earth's moon and we always knew about it. But we just started to learn about moons around other planets um, around the same time that Galileo discovered the big moons of Jupiter called the Galilean moons in 1610. And we also know that there's a lot of things that aren't planets that also have moons, like Pluto has a, is not a planet, and it has this really large moon named Charon that was discovered in 1978. But as science and technology has really continued to expand, we've also had to expand our understanding of what a moon is. It's no longer just a body that goes around a planet, it's something that goes around something else, or in this case, a moon with a moon. I also did a lot of reading I looked up a lot of different scientific papers to find out how other scientists described these moons. Did they describe these as Trojan moons? Did they describe these as moons of moons? And I discovered with all of the facts that I looked up that I agreed with this story. I agreed with calling these moons of moons. Hmm. I, first of all, that's no moon. That, that line's <laughs> gotta be said. And, and second, now I'm rethinking our entire team because they've been working on this for a long time. And, and like I asked, one of the things that came up early on in the planning of this show today was we wanted to make sure that we watermarked all of the videos so that they couldn't you know, be taken later and used by somebody saying, see, National Air and Space Museum said this was true. 
And I brought it up in a in a production meeting a couple of weeks ago, and one of our producers just looked at me and goes, oh yeah, we do that on the back end, so you won't see it. And now I'm wondering, is there no watermark on the broadcast going out today? I have no idea. Like, I'm totally messed up. I can reassure you that there was a watermark on every false statement, except <laughs> mine. <laughs> oh, we knew the watermark. Yeah, we, we wow. knew about the watermark. I guess the watermark is the uh, is the lie, huh? That's wild. So that's no better at this than I am. Well, I think I. You know, here's the thing: we got a great on the curve, right? I stuck with my story. I stuck with my story. Yeah, Beth's, uh, Beth's, uh, Beth's, Beth's thinking, I think, was clearer, <laughs> even uh, even though she was working with uh, falsified data. And, so and Beth did do better on the rehearsal. So it's true. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Um, so thank you to everyone who's tuning in today. Uh, we even have viewers from Kazakhstan. So uh, thanks. Uh, let us know if the hotel at the Baikonur Airport is a good place to spend two days. And uh, this has been this has been a lot of fun, huh, guys? This yeah. has been great. Thank you for everybody watching. I mean, I, I've, I've enjoyed this, and, and I think it just shows how important looking at those sources really is. Um, when you're trying to assess information, especially in a day and age when there is so much information on the internet. Um, I taught fifth grade for a long time. And one day I was trying to um, teach about, you know, validity of information. And so I, I went to Wikipedia and looked up George Washington. And two days earlier, his entry had said that he won the Revolutionary War because of a band of ninja monkeys. And ever since then, I've been skeptical of everything that I see online and go back to verify the sources. And I think this just proves it. And, and our experts are world class and and uh, have illustrated that today. Yeah, and I'm going to do research on these Trojan moons because I don't know if I'm buying it yet. Yeah. Um, Mike and Emily and Kathy putting the class in world class research today. We do appreciate it. We appreciate both of you for playing along with our game. Hopefully everyone has learned a little bit of something about research verification and has three fun new stories to fool their friends. Last week, we released a special Flights of Fancy feature uh, for the book, The Stuff Between the Stars, which tells the story of astronomer Vera Rubin in the video. Author Sandra Nichol reads the book, and afterwards, she and illustrator Amy Sakuro talk about the process of turning the story into of an inspiring woman of astronomy into a children's book. They also discuss how research is done in very different ways for different purposes. Important lesson from today. You can find this video on the National Air and Space Museum's YouTube channel. And a week from today, on April 8th, a new STEM in 30 episode will be released about the legacy of the space shuttle and its incredible impact on the history of human space flight. Last Thursday, our podcast series released an episode on black holes that doesn't suck if I do say so myself. And next Thursday, we will be releasing an episode about how things in space get their names. It's a bumpy ride, and we hope you'll come along. A reminder that this live chat will be available on Facebook and YouTube after the program ends. So please share the video with your friends and see if you can fool them because you've already got the answer. Thank you for joining us, and everyone stay safe and skeptical out there. Thanks. See y'all.